Welcome back. Uh, this afternoon we have Stephen Ellis presenting. He's a long-term advocate of open source. You may remember him from such shows as OSDC in New Zealand and the last Linux Conf. Uh, this afternoon he's talking about cloud crafting, public-private hybrid. Please make him feel welcome. It's really interesting doing the site visit here and looking at this auditorium going, I really want to speak here, I really want to speak here. I didn't expect those great big lights. So if I look a little blurry-eyed, that's what it's all about. So hi, I'm Stephen Ellis. I work regionally for Red Hat. This is more about community, community projects, things that we want to get more people involved with, and how do you interact with cloud and virtualization technologies today? So a lot of people in the industry are going about hybrid, hybrid cloud, hybrid this, hybrid that. So what does it really all mean to you? What does hybrid mean to you in the audience? And I always used to think of this when anyone talked about hybrid. I'm afraid recently I tend to think of this. So that, that appeals to the geek in me. If you don't get the reference, then you're kind of a little bit behind in your Doctor Who episodes. So the public cloud. Now, a great many of you here today probably consume some form of the public cloud. Probably one of the technologies on screen here. You know, how many of you here in the audience use Amazon today in some form? Right? How many of you are using one of the other cloud providers here on the screen? That's quite a considerable number of you. And there's a number of providers now starting to use OpenStack to set up a public cloud. Private, what is private cloud? What is private infrastructure as a service? Because that's what we typically at Red Hat talk to it in terms of. So how many of you use what one of my colleagues terms legacy virtualization? <laughs> VMware. Do a number of you use VMware? Yes, quite a number of you. But there's several other technologies dominant in the data center. So how many of you use something other than VMware that's on screen here? Yeah, this is a fairly good chunk of you. So when we talk about hybrid, we want something that will communicate to the public cloud, allow us to manage equivalent workloads on premise, give us that idea of a stretch environment. I really love this. I love that icon in the middle. It's just really neat. But it's all about interoperability. A lot of people talking about this tend to focus on, well, everything's going to be virtual. How many people still have TIN in the data center that they have to manage? They would still need to occasionally provision bare metal. And I don't mean throwing a hypervisor on it. I mean actually running a workload on bare metal. And of course, the big thing now is Manage IQ can deal with this. Manage IQ can provision down to bare metal. Manage IQ, upstream open source project, can understand a range of cloud technologies. And Manage IQ can also talk to the public cloud through their APIs. So it gives you, you know, that overused term, a single pane of glass. And the really neat thing is it also now does containers as well. So if you're using technologies like Kubernetes, then it can actually manage and orchestrate and understand containers as first class citizens, as well as physical and virtual resources. This is really powerful now, because we have one point for everything we can do in the data center. Well, not quite, because we still have storage, we still have networking. That's why I'm talking to you lot. Here's an opportunity to extend it. There's several vendors out there today writing plugins upstream for Manage IQ so that it can do software-defined networking, so that it can do software-defined storage, so that it can plug into your NetApp or your EMC storage array. Providers today out of the box include VMware, Microsoft, Hyper-V, uh, our own virtualization technology from Red Hat, as well as Amazon, Azure, and currently we're certified against our build of OpenStack. I'd really love to see the community help it certify against all the other builds coming out through community projects. Because really, it's down to validation. There's some minor differences because the way OpenStack messaging queues are implemented by some of the uh, different distributions. You know, a really big recent addition has been Azure support. But behind the scenes, Google Compute Engine support's almost ready. It's almost ready for prime time. And then, as I mentioned, it can now manage containers as well. So what's it, what's it offering? We say it's going to manage. What does it do? And I was talking to a few people before I came in. And one aspect of this is brownfields as well as greenfields. It gives you insight about everything you're doing today. 
So the moment you hook it into your hypervisors, the moment you hook it into your cloud providers, it starts introspecting, it starts data gathering. And in conferences like this, when we talk about configuration management, we're often talking about things like Ansible and Puppet and Chef. But in a corporate world, what they're often talking about is their CMDB. They're talking about managing assets. You can go and suck all the data out of this through a RESTful API, use it to validate and manage your asset register. So the insight capabilities, the discovery capabilities are really important. Control, the ability to prevent a virtual machine or a cloud environment from starting because it breaks a security policy. The ability to detect through your infrastructure when an environment's non-compliant because shell shocks just come out. Which systems do I need to patch? Uh, which systems running Windows are not meeting a security policy because they haven't been patched to a certain level. They don't have the most recent antivirus. Automation, being able to define beyond simple deployment of a virtual machine, being able to actually define a workload, a business workload combining physical, virtual, cloud, and container resources that your developer or your uh, deployment team can go in and literally press a button, provide a few credentials, and away it goes. It will deploy and redeploy environments based off a service catalog. And then integration, because everything's RESTful. If you have existing operational management tools, they can come in through that RESTful API. So it's really easy to integrate into everything else you're doing. But also, we've done a lot of work around integrating it into other tools, aside from talking to technology like the Foreman and shortly uh, Ansible Tower, it's going to talk to a number of ticketing systems that large corporate environments use. So if you're using something like ServiceNow, why not add people as a service to a workflow? If you have an automation process where a point in that requires your firewall team to go off and do something that you can't automate, then have the managed IQ raise a ticket in your ticketing system, and it only completes the workflow when the ticketing system closes that ticket. You automate as much as possible. That's really powerful because then you can detect the bits that aren't automated, the bits that are taking the most time, and put them down as the next point to automate, the next point in your process that you need to speed up. Manage IQ can run on-premise, and it can run in the public cloud and it's designed to cloud scale. So it's not just, a, it's supplied in the form of a virtual appliance, you can deploy anywhere, but it's designed to scale out. It's designed to be HA, it's designed to be a cattle rather than a pet, for something, that, uh, you know, a term that's been used earlier today. What is Manage IQ? Well, it's all based around Ruby. It's really interesting when you start it off for the first time, you notice that the virtual appliance, a virtual machine you're running, has a ton of Ruby processes running, gets absolutely flat line. So if you're going to play with this, use a decent amount of vCPU, decent amount of RAM. Uh, the upstream virtual appliance is CentOS 7 based, and it uses Rails and Postgres under the hood. It has a web UI for operational management, reporting, a range of dashboards and roles out of the box. So you can give your executive user one of those nice you know, green, amber, red dashboards, a view of their environment, but they can't go poking around changing anything. You can give your developers access to a service catalog that is only allowed to deploy in the environments that they are allowed and they have access to. You can do quotas and charge back and reporting. Recent addition with the latest releases has been the uh, container management features. So this is, the focus on this is a little soft, uh, but this is showing the container tab, number of workloads running, what's going on, how much CPU and memory. This is an aggregated view of all the container workloads Manage IQ has introspected and found. So we get the ability to discover brownfields, existing workloads, and deploy and deliver net new workloads. We want you to get involved, so how do you do that? So the Manage IQ community is online, a lot of documentation, IRC, all the usual environments. The roadmap is fully public, so you can see how, how um, contributions 
are developing, how enhancements are moving forward, propose new enhancements to the uh, tool. And there's been a range of, of commercial contributors. A number of businesses have decided to contribute actively to Manage IQ. In fact, the new self-service dialogues for uh, provisioning have been contributed by one of the businesses up here. I can't remember if it was Booz Allen or BBVA. Um, there's a lot going on now in that ecosystem. Nuage Networks contributing software-defined networking plugins to Manage IQ. Uh, Chef are adding plugins to extend its support to use Chef as a configuration management tool. So what's it all about? How do you use it? How do you play with it? So I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo. But if you want to go and have a try, go to Manage IQ. You can go and pull down a pre-built virtual appliance. Uh, it's easy enough to deploy an OpenStack, Over, or Rev, or VMware. If you're using any other virtualization technology, if you know what you're doing, you should easily be able to take the QCOW image for OpenStack and deploy that. In the case of my own laptop, I'm just using libvirt. So this is what I do. I go and pull down the image, and I'll create a fresh snapshot for my working environment, and I'll use vert install to spin it up, and then it has a default username and password for the first time you get this up and running. Uh, so let's just change tabs quickly. So right now, this is brand new, clean, fresh out the box, isn't talking to any infrastructure, isn't talking to any cloud providers. And so along the top, we can see uh, where we manage our service catalogs where we can define those service catalogs. We manage cloud and infrastructure differently. Infrastructure is where the technology is on premise. I own the hypervisor. I own the storage. I can go a bit deeper. When we talk to something like OpenStack, it could be a cloud, as in we're using cloud APIs. It's off premise. Or it could be infrastructure. It's on premise. Therefore, I own the hypervisor. I can do much deeper introspection. Owning the hypervisor is important because we can introspect much deeper into running virtual machines. We do a thing called fleecing, where we take a snapshot of a virtual machine, hide it off to one side, and then mount it and introspect its disk. It means whether it's running Linux or Windows, we can tell every package what's in ETC. We can read the registry. We can introspect a lot of information without ever installing an agent. And in fact, we're working with Microsoft and Amazon to allow that capability to happen in the public cloud as well. So you get very, very deep, detailed information about your ecosystem. So we have clouds, infrastructure, and containers. So if I was going to add a new cloud provider, I simply add, choose the type, Azure, Amazon, EC2. And I need. Some credentials. Confirm my credentials. Oh, I didn't choose a region. Let's go for Sydney. Right, so now I've got that region added. Really, I should have just called it AWS Sydney. Right now, I've got no workloads running there, but that would now start connecting and discovering what templates I've got, what running uh, instances I've got, what resources I'm consuming within Amazon. Same thing happens when you connect it to Azure or into um, OpenStack. One of the first things you really need to do is do a refresh of the environment, make sure that you pull down all the information that you can about it. And if I've had any virtual machines running there, I will start discovering information about them. Everything starts to be pulled back. I can now start provisioning there. If I've got existing templates, I could use this just to provision them, or I could start actually building a service catalog. If you're using uh, capabilities like um, heat in OpenStack or cloud formations in Amazon, It'll also start discovering those templates and allow you to use them as part of your provisioning dialogues. So it's extremely powerful what you can actually do with it. I also have an environment here, which is kind of the Red Hat skinned version, the 
But this one's actually got a lot of data already loaded. So I can already tell the range of operating system versions that we've got running within the infrastructure I can see. I'm currently talking to VMware and Red Hat virtualization. If I change over, I'm actually talking to an OpenStack cloud as well. And all this data has been collected. None of it's been entered manually. All I've done is provide credentials. This is so useful. It solves a really big problem for us. How do we spin up demo environments really quickly? How do we provide, provide training environments? Those are the sort of thing that are regularly reproducible. We use this now. We have a service catalog. You want a training environment? Go and click a button. It's loaded. It only runs for three, eight, three days because we can set a retirement date so we don't squander valuable resources by keeping things powered on forever. So this is a great project. I really encourage you to go and have a play. If you, it's, its aim is not to be what they call the lowest common denominator cloud platform. Its aim is to be a superset of the features of all the different cloud technologies out there today. But it still needs help. It still needs love. There's a bunch of technologies out there it hasn't embraced yet. So please help us extend it. So, any questions? Very quiet. Any questions? If not, we'll finish early. Move on. All right. Thank you very much, Stephen.